Okay, so we finished the peripheral nervous system at this point, and now we're going to go into the central nervous system, which again is the cerebral cortex, the cerebrum, the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord. Before we cover the actual substance of the spinal cord, let's make sure we cover all the external layers surrounding it. And I'm sure some of this should be reviewed from anatomy. The dura mater, otherwise known as the tough mother, is the outer coating, very strong connective tissue. Lying right under it and actually attached to it is the arachnoid membrane, which is very light, very um, weak and thin. And it's basically in contact with the undersurface of the dura mater. <clears throat> but in be between the arachnoid and dura mater, there is a potential space called the subdural space. And in between, then the, from the arachnoid to the actual substance of the spinal cord, you have the pia mater, which is actually attached and on, covers the spinal cord proper itself. And in between the pia mater and arachnoid, you have the subarachnoid space, which is where your cerebral spinal fluid is in. And then the pia mater has extensions off of it called the denticulate ligament and the phylum terminale. We're going to talk about that in a moment. The dura mater and the arachnoid together form what's called the dural sac or the fecal sac. The epidural space is space that's between the dural sac and the bony vertebral column of the vertebrae. And in between, so between the dura mater and the bony uh, hole in the, in the vertebral column is the epidural space, epi meaning above or outside of the dura mater. And it's in, that space is filled with fat and blood vessels, and that's where a physician will inject an anti-inflammatory into that epidural space that's your epidural shot. And that's meant that anesthetic then gets absorbed by the blood vessels there, and that's how you get the effect of the anesthetic. In a previous slide, I had mentioned that the pia matter had extensions that came off of it. The pia matter, again, is that very thin connective tissue that's directly attached to the spinal cord. Some of those extensions extend out laterally. Those are the denticulate ligaments. They kind of anchor and hold the spinal cord so it's not flopping around in the cerebral spinal fluid. And at the, the very tip of the spinal cord, the pia mater comes together and forms the phylum terminale, which then connects the dural sac to the uh, or, or connects the spinal cord to the dural sac and anchors the spinal cord so it doesn't flip upwards. And then the dural sac itself, again, the arachnoid and the, the um, dura mater together forming a dural sac, comes together at its end point distally and forms what's known as the cosageal ligament, which attaches to the coccyx. So starting at the spinal cord, which you know begins at the foramen magnum and extends all the way down to an adult about the L1, L2 vertebral segment. And it contains eight cervical segments, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and anywhere from one to three cosageal segments. The enlargements are at the cervical, at C4 through T1, the lumbar L2 to S2, uh, the cauda equina, or the ventral and dorsal roots of the lumbar and sacral segments. And we're going to be talking about all this in subsequent slides. C1 through C7 spinal nerve roots exit the IV frame and above the corresponding vertebrae, and C8 and below exit below the corresponding vertebrae. If you observe the spinal cord from the longitudinal view, you can see there are two enlargement parts on the spinal cord. We call them cervical enlargement and lumbar enlargement. 
the cerebral enlargement uh, gave rise to a lot of spinal nerves for to control our upper extremity. And the lumbar enlargement gave rise to spinal nerves for lower extremity. And uh, the end of the uh, spinal cord, you can see there is a cone-shaped end, and it's located around vertebral level L2, L1 to L2. Because the spinal cord is shorter than the vertebral column, uh, but the spinal nerve from C8 and below still exit at their respective intervertebral foramina. Uh, so the dorsal and ventral roots become progressively longer from uh, C8 to sacral level. And uh, so at the end of the spinal cord, the uh, lumbar and sacral nerves forms this uh, cauda equina. They just located in this lumbar cistern. So this cistern is located um, between the end of the spinal cord and the end of the dural sheath. So it's an enlarged uh, subarachnoid space. We call it lumbar cistern. And uh, it's a, say, a relatively safe site for lumbar puncture. Before we talk about the structure of the spinal cord, you need to know a uh, concept which is called a spinal cord segment. This uh, spinal cord segment is a portion of this uh, spinal cord just to give rise to a spinal nerve on each side. From this video, you can see uh, so you have this uh, cross section of the uh, spinal cord. You can see from the lateral side, you have the uh, dorsal and ventral rootlet came out from the spinal cord, and then they forms the, a pair of the spinal nerve. So this form gives you the number and names of the spinal cord segment from the ne neck to tailbone you have eight uh, cervical spinal cord segment and the 12 uh, thoracic and uh, five lumbar, five sacral and one coxial uh, spinal cord segment. And it gives uh, 31 pairs of uh, spinal nerve. When we talk about the spinal cord segment, there are two concepts that we need to know. One is this uh, dermatome. So dermatome means uh, the area of skin in which to buy a single spinal cord segment. So because we are talking about the skin, it's all about sensory nerve. So uh, this nerve came from a single dorsal root ganglion. So when you talk, when you observe the when you see these pictures these pictures shows you the arrangement of this um, spinal cord segment and you can see the green means the cervical part cervical uh, spinal cord uh, and uh, the red represent the thoracic part and uh, the blue uh, is innervated by the lumbar spinal cord and uh, you can see this is um, this uh, dermatome arranged in a very regular mode. And you can see, for example, the T4 is around the nipple line, and uh, T10 is around in the uh, umbilicus level. Another concept that we're talking about it is um, uh, myotome. Myotome is a group of muscle innervated by a single spinal cord segment. So we're talking about the motor nerve. Uh, most of the muscle are actually are uh, innervated by more than one spinal uh, segment. And there are two muscle groups, like five in the arm, five in the leg, 
usually we, we, uh, we use these muscle groups to test for the motor function of the spinal segment. Uh, there's a form which shows you the muscle group actions, like uh, elbow flexion is uh, innovated by C5, and the hip flexion is innovated by L2. What you see on the right are different areas, cross-section of the spinal cord. And you can see that the black areas, which are the gray matter, which are where the nerve cell bodies are, is designed differently as you go up and down the spinal cord. And we're going to be talking about those different levels of the spinal cord. Now let's talk about the spinal cord itself. This is a cross section of it. And there's some fissures and uh, white and gray matter to at least to now be initiated to. You have a ventral median fissure. That's where the anterior spinal artery resides. You have a dorsal median fissure and two, depending on where you're at in the spinal cord, you might have these dorsal intermediate septums. All of that is printed there if you can look at the small writing. There's a central canal, which is an extension of the fourth ventricle. And then this is the typical case. The white matter appears darker. So all that gray that you see is the white matter. And the gray matter is the whiter, lighter color in the middle. The gray matter is where the cell bodies of neurons are. The white matter are the axons, the tracks running up and down the spinal cord. We are looking at the central portion of the cross section of the spinal cord. You can see the H-shaped uh, gray matter. On the top is the dorsal part. On the bottom is the ventral part. So you can see this H-shaped gray matter have two, like two pair of these horns. So in the bottom, it's a ventral side. You have the ventral horn. It's relatively thick and uh, bigger. So the in the top, in the it's a dorsal horn. So the dorsal horn and the ventral horn between it, you have this intermediate zone and uh, between these uh, two anterior and posterior horn and you can see uh, the H shape the horizontal one is a, a gray chemistry and uh, when you when you see this we observe it is a um, white matter uh, we call it white matter because the white matter is a bunch of this nerve fibers. The nerve fibers was myelinated. So uh, in the live specimen, it should be lighter. But here, this picture shows you that yeah, the, when you die with a special uh, method, in this um, white matter actually looks darker. So this white matter, uh, according to the location, can be divided into um, funiculi or columns. So we can call it the ventral side, we can call it ventral funiculi. And uh, the, lab, the two lateral side, we call it lateral funiculi. And uh, the dorsal side is dorsal funiculi. Actually, there are two camera. So the Greek I'm sure already talked about is connect 
two sides of the gray matter. And just anterior to it, inside the anterior column, you can see this anterior white camera, which connect the two sides of white matter. So which contains the uh, decrossating or cross of these axons. There are two pair of these uh, sulcus on the spinal cord uh, cross section. And uh, one pair is in the anterior side is on the bottom in this picture. That is a anterior lateral sulcus. And in the posterior, you have this posterior lateral sulcus, uh, which is formed by the uh, dorsal root and the ventral root of the spinal cord, the spinal nerve. And uh, so you can see uh, the ventral rootlet here is exit from the anterior lateral sulcus. So, which is a motor efferent nerve. And uh, the dorsal rootlet merge into the spinal cord through this posterior lateral sulcus. And uh, before it goes into the spinal cord, it, you can see uh, that it's an enlarged part, that enlarged part of it is dorsal root ganglion, which is um, collection of the cell body of the sensory nerve. When you co compare the different level uh, of this cross, cross section of the spinal cord, you can see uh, the relative amount of the gray and white matter, the shape of the gray matter is different or varied uh, from different level. And you can see this cervical segment um, are relatively large and uh, in an uh, ovid shape. So you remember that we talk about the longitudinal view of the spinal cord and you have a cervical enlargement. That's because uh, the, in this area, you have a large amount of the ascending and descending axons. And also uh, for the motor horn, the ventral horn, uh, you need to give um, a lot of uh, motor nerves to the upper limb. And the thoracic segment is relatively smaller because they don't contain uh, as many of these motor, motor neurons compared to the uh, upper limb and lower limb in the cervical and lumbar part. And, but it have a special part we call it lateral horn. This lateral horn, because it have the cell bodies from the sympathetic central. So you have a lot of uh, neural, neural cell bodies there. Uh, so the lateral horn is uh, present in all thoracic segment. And if you look at the lumbar part, the lumbar part have uh, like massive ventral and dorsal horn uh, because these part also get, need to give a lot of nerve to lower limb. And uh, the upper part of the lumbar segment also have lateral horn as, as a, a same as this uh, thoracic segment. In the, the sacral segment, and you can see the cross section of the sacral segment are relatively small, uh, but it's have a, a large amount of these uh, gray matters because um, this uh, little white matter, because the descending, um, descending motor pathways have already given off most of their terminations at the higher segment, and the ascending pathways just beginning to collect axons at the more cardiac segment.
So the dose of greyhorn receives sensory or uh, afferent nerves from dorsal root. And uh, this, for this part, uh, the, neurons, the neural cells are mostly the interneurons or project neurons. And uh, if they can further divide into two parts, so one is the substantia glutinosa, so we call it SG part. This part just like a caps uh, for the poster horn. And uh, this part actually uh, modulate pain and temperature information. And uh, in this picture below it or anterior to it, you can see the body part. So this part deal mostly with this um, somatic and uh, visual sensory information. The ventral gray horn contains uh, a lot of cell bodies of motor neuron. This motor neuron supplies the uh, skeletal muscle. So damage of this part, the ventral gray horn, will cause the flaccid paralyze of the skeletal muscle and uh, the muscle cannot contract and finally it becomes like atrophy and uh, uh, this motor neuron we call it lower motor neuron and because we have an upper motor neuron which located in the cerebral cortex The gray matter does have what's known as somatotropic localization. Somato means body, tropic means topography, or like a map. And you can see how the gray matter is oriented there. That ventral gray horn, there are alpha and gamma motor neuron cell bodies for the shoulder and the arm are located in the most medial. That'd be your ventral medial gray horn. And then as you go out laterally, you get out to the forearm and the hand is more alpha and gamma motor neurons to innervate those areas are located more laterally. And additionally, there's also some other nuclei in the gray matter. Uh, the spinal accessory nucleus. C3-4 levels is cranial nerve number 11, to innervate this sternocleidomastoid muscle. Its origin is in the, in the cervical spinal cord at C3-4 levels. So that nucleus is there for the SCM. And then the phrenic nuclei at C3, C4, and C5 levels of gray matter would be the motor neurons for the diaphragm. Between the dorsal and ventral horn, uh, you have this intermediate gray matter. This gray matter, which contains uh, the proganglic autonomic nerves, which include sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic neuron, proganglion neurons. So mm, you have this intermedial lateral cell column, which contains which present from T1 to L4. Uh, so it contains the sympathetic nerve system, the sympathetic preganglia uh, neural cell bodies, uh, which is the lateral horn. And uh, these axons live through the ventral, ventral root. And uh, in the S2, to S4 level, though the intermediate gray matters, uh, which con which contains contains the sacral parasympathetic nucleus. These axons also live through ventral root. So. We already talked about the gray matter. It's made of uh, the ventral horn, dorsal horn, and the intermediate horn. 
And uh, before we moving on to the wide matter, let's take a minute to review some of the terminology you have learned previously. So you fill in the blanks according to our formal lectures, okay? The spinal cord, uh, just like a pathway which connect the higher order of our central nervous system to more peripheral effector like our upper limb, lower limb, and uh, which contain a lot of these uh, axons, bundles of axons, uh, which are have the same origin, same termination, and the same cause. So this a collection of these tract or uh, fasciculi, we call it a nuclei or a column. So according to the location, we can divide this uh, wide matters to anterior, posterior, and lateral column. So the posterior column located between the posterior median sulcus and the posterior horn. And the lateral sulcus, you can see the blue color, that's located between um, where the dorsal and the ventral roots emerge, like between it. And uh, the anterior column located between the, um, where the ventral root emerge and the anterior median fissure. And we'll start with the dorsal funiculus. Funicula, again, is another name for a column. The dorsal funiculus is located between the two dorsal gray horns. And if you can go back to the slide that, that outlined with the two arrows where the dorsal gray horn is. And you have a right and a left dorsal gray horn. So all that white matter in between is the dorsal funiculus. And you have a right dorsal funiculus and a left dorsal funiculus separated by that dorsal median septum. <clears throat> now, depending on the level of the spinal cord that you're in, that a, the right or the left dorsal funiculus might contain two major uh, fascicles. In this case, this is at the cervical cross-section of the spinal cord. And if you're T6 level or higher, you will have in the dorsal funiculus both a fasciculus gracilis, which is the one that's the most medial that the arrow is pointing to, and a fasciculus cuneatus, which is where the lateral area arrow is pointing to. So T6 level or above, in the dorsal funiculus would be subdivided into a fasciculus gracilis and a fasciculus cuneatus. Both of those are, car are axons carrying, ascending axons carrying two-point discrimination, vibration sense, fine discriminatory touch, and conscious position sense. From the ipsilateral lower trunk, and lower extremity, that's what the fasciculus gracilis is carrying. And from the upper trunk and upper extremity, which is what the fasciculus cuneatus is carrying. That's why if you're above in the cervical area, you would have those sensations being care come in, coming in from the upper extremity and the upper trunk going up the fasciculus cuneatus. The lower extremity on that side and the lower trunk are carrying those sensations up through the fasciculus gracilis, up to the medulla. So the lateral funiscus actually located between the, the two horns. Uh, you can see from this picture, which include a lot of uh, tracks, this track could, could be descending or ascending uh, tracks. Descending means uh, these tracks 
uh, came from the high order of the central nervous system, which runs down to the lower part of the um, central nervous system. So the descending tracts include the lateral cortical spinal tracts and the rubral spinal tract. And now you just need to know this name and we will talk about it in detail later. The ascending tracts, uh, it's a blue one. You can see from the right side. You can see here, it's a, you have this spinal cerebellar tracts, which include dorsal and ventral part, and part of this uh, lateral spinal thalamatic tracts because part of them are located in the win this uh, ventral column. The ventral veniscus or ventral column, uh, just uh, between the uh, two anterior horns, the two ventral horn, and uh, you can see from the right picture, uh, here is uh, the descending tract which labeled with red and the ascending tract labeled in, in blue. So you have this uh, anterior cortical spinal tract and uh, radical, radical um, spinal tract and the lateral vestibular spinal tract. That is a descending tract. And you have part of this uh, lateral spinal thalamic uh, tract, which is a uh, ascending tract. A lot of um, informations are processing or passing through the spinal cord. Um, the flow of these um, information could be described like this. The somatic sensory information enters the spinal cord through the dorsal root, and these fibers could form uh, synapse in, in the ipsilateral gray matter, or it just directly continue ascending to the brain, like towards the brainstem. And this uh, and forms this ascending tracks. These ascending tracks bring this information to the brain. And the brain collect and uh, analyze all this information from different area. And then they give out a commanding. The command just uh, bring out by the descending, tra descending tract and then back through this spinal cord. And then finally, uh, this um, uh, ventral root will give or transmit out this motor or autonomic information to like the um, somatic or like skeletal muscles uh, or smooth muscles. And also like uh, a simple way, the spinal cord reflex could also present. The spinal cord reflex are simple behavior produced by central nervous system pathway that lies entirely within the spinal cord. So the sensory afferent fibers that evoke this reflex enter the spinal cord and activate spinal motor neurons directly or through a chain of one or more spinal interneurons. So at minimum, the spinal reflex involve uh, five parts. So a sensory receptor and afferent uh, or sensory neuron, a synapse and uh, the uh, different uh, neuron and uh, the effector. One kind of this uh, spinal reflex is a monosynaptic reflex. Actually, we already mentioned it when we talk about the uh, muscle spindle. So this mono 
synapse uh, reflex. The example of it is this uh, uh, muscle stretching reflex. So the sensory receptor is a muscle spindle. When you uh, using the hammer to lock the the tendon, the quadriceps tendon, and the, the muscles the muscle spindle got stretched. And then uh, this signal uh, goes into the spinal cord through this uh, dorsal ganglion, and then uh, it synapses with a different um, neuron of the same muscle to produce these muscle contractions. So the importance of this uh, monosynaptic reflex is to maintain this autonomic postural correction. Another spinal reflex example is a flexion reflex or withdrawal reflex. This one uh, involved in more than one synapse, so it's not a, a monosynaptic reflex. Um, so the, when you step on the, on the needle, you feel pain, and uh, this um, sensory receptor will be the noisy receptors or the free endings, free nerve endings. They send a signal um, inside the spinal cord through the dorsal, dorsal root, and um, these um, nerve will synapse on multiple interneurons. So it could have multiple efferent neurons because when you step on this needle, you flex, you withdraw the same side of your leg. And then at the same time when you're standing because you're walking, so your other leg will just directly extend because you want to keep your posture. So they they have another circuit to cause the contralateral limb to demonstrate the extension. So that cause uh, that's called uh, the cross extension reflex. So now we move on to the brainstem. So today we only talk about the gross anatomy of the brainstem and uh, the uh, insides structures. We will talk about it later. So let's see these pictures. Um, these pictures show you the brainstem from the anterior wheel and the posterior wheel. So it's located between the cerebr cerebrum and uh, the uh, spinal cord. It can be divided into three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medal. So the first uh, general function of the brain stem is it contains a lot of uh, pathways, which include the ascending tracts, which uh, bring the uh, the uh, information to the thalamus and the cerebellum, and the descending tracts which bring the commanding from the high order of the central nervous system to the spinal cord. And uh, the second function is about the cranial nerve. So among these 12 pair of the uh, cranial nerve, there are 10 pair of this cranial nerve project or emerge from this uh, brainstem part. And uh, the uh, third function is, we call it integrative function, because a number of this uh, integrative function are organized at the level of uh, brainstem, such as uh, the respiratory and uh, cardiovascular activities. And uh, uh, some regulation of the level of uh, consciousness. So most of this uh, is accomplished by reticular formation. This uh, reticular formation uh, forms the central core of the brainstem. 
First, let's talk about the external anatomical feature of the brainstem. We will observe each part of this uh, brainstem from the anterior and the posterior view. So if you observe the medulla from the posterior view, from the, this picture, and you can see this uh, bottom, the bottom part is the medulla. The, this part connect um, the uh, spinal cord to the pons. And uh, posterior to it, you can find the cerebellum. From this picture, the cerebellum already been removed. And uh, the uh, shape of this uh, medulla is much more similar to the spinal cord. And uh, on this uh, pre posterior view, we can divide into two divisions. So we can call it the rustro, rustro portion. So that rustro portion have an like part that uh, have a feature that you can see it that is the opening opens to the uh, fourth ventri ventricle. You can see the uh, that groove. I labeled it with V. That is a fourth ventricle. And the the second division is a cardio par cardio portion, which contains the uh, central canal. So there is a term you need to remember is the obex. The obex is a junction between the fourth ventricle and the central canal. And you can see a lobe labeled it with a dark dot. We already talked about in the posterior or the, or the dorsal column or the spinal cord, you have this Paniculus cuneatus and uh, paniculus gracilis. So, um, in the medulla level, the uh, two paniculus will reach to the top of this uh, medulla, and you can see I labeled uh, this uh, two paniculus with different color. So the green color. Um, is this um, paniculus gracilis. On the top of this uh, paniculus, you can find two tubercles. We call it gracile tubercle. And uh, under this tubercle, you have a nuclei that we call it nucleus gracilis. And uh, the uh, yellow color, which labels the paniculus cuneatus, so the top of it, you can find a two dot that is a cuneate tubercle. So underlying it, you have the nucleus cuneatus. And the, uh, on the top, on the top part, the justome medulla comprise a part the, of the floor of the uh, fourth ventricle. When we turn to the anterior view of the medulla, and uh, you can see on the top of the medulla is the bridge-like pons, and uh, under it should be the spinal cord. So let's see some structures on this part. So you can see in the middle, I labeled a red line. That is an anterior median fissure. And uh, on the both side of this um, red line, you can see two yellow circle. That is the location of the pyramids. The pyramids are two vertical bulge along this um, anterior median fissure. And uh, under, under the um, the pyramids and at the 
junction between the spinal cord and the medulla, that is a uh, pyramidal deposition, which I labeled it with blue color. And uh, uh, at the lateral side of this uh, yellow circle, you can see two purple vertical lines. That is the location of an anterior lateral sulcus, which uh, the, the, at the middle side is a pyramid. And uh, at the lateral side of this uh, purple line, you can see two oval bulge. We call this olives. So when we move a little bit uh, higher, you can see the uh, pounds. This is the anterior view of the pounds. And uh, you can see this pounds have a, a big bulge. So we call this basal pounds. And uh, in the middle of this uh, bulge, you can see this sulcus that is a bas basilar sulcus that is on the middle line, and uh, which have in, in the live specimen, you can see a, an artery lies in this uh, sulcus. And uh, in the lateral side of the pounds, I labeled if it's um, red color, that is the middle cerebellar peduncle. The peduncle, uh, the uh, cerebell cerebellum have uh, three pair of this peduncle. This is a middle one. That is the uh, uh, transverse fiber bundles, which connects the pounds to the cerebellum. When we observe the uh, Pounds from the medial view, and you can see this picture shows you the uh, mid sagittal section of the brain. The right side is the anterior side, the left side is the posterior side. And uh, I label the basal pounds with red line. And you can see posterior to the brain stem, you can see the cerebellum. So the cerebellum connects the brain stem with, um, uh, with three pair of these uh, peduncles. But here you can see I label this SCP, that is a superior cerebellar peduncle. Uh, and under it, you can see uh, number four, that is a fourth ventricle. And uh, so the superior cerebellar peduncle forms the roof of the fourth ventricle. And uh, so the posterior side of the pumps forms the floor of the fourth ventricle. So let's move to the midbrain. So the midbrain is located superior, superior to the pumps. And on the top of the picture, you can see that is the anterior view, and the lower picture is this uh, posterior view. So from the anterior view, I labeled these uh, two vertical fibers, which just uh, like two legs that we call it cere cerebral peduncle or cruise of uh, cerebri. That means the leg of the brain. And um, the posterior view, and uh, you can see I labeled four circles. Uh, the top two circles, we call it um, the superior colloquially, and uh, the, the bottom two circles, that is the uh, uh, inferior colloquially. And this one shows you the whole posterior view of the brain stem. And uh, with this picture, it's quite clear. And you can see the brain, the Mid-brain, the posterior side, you have these four uh, tubercles. The superior is superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. And uh, under this mid-brain, that is a pounds, the posterior pounds. And you can see the mid-cerebellar peduncle. 
and uh, I lay also label the roof of this uh, fourth ventricle. Uh, you can see the SCP that is the superior cerebellar peduncle, and uh, uh, between this um, these uh, peduncles, you can see a diamond shaped uh, part that is um, the floor of the fourth ventricle. But this uh, floor of the ventricle, the top part is a uh, pumps, and uh, the lower part is uh, located um, at the posterior side of the medulla. Okay, let's talk about the internal anatomical feature of the brainstem. And then you can see this picture shows you the medial view of the uh, brainstem. And then it says the sagittal section. The left side will be the anterior part. The right side will be the posterior part. And the anterior part, you can see the brainstem. And the posterior to it, you can see the uh, cerebellum. Between these two parts, I have labeled this uh, triangular shape that is a fourth ventricle. So uh, from this, this uh, view, you can actually uh, divide this pumps to this uh, brainstem to three parts. So in the posterior set, and uh, you can see I labeled that small part into uh, in a red color. So this, color, this part we call it tectum. This area posterior to the ventricular space, we, can, we call it roof, the roof. And uh, uh, the middle part, I labeled it with green color. And this area, we call this um, area tegmentum. That is anterior to the fourth ventricle. Uh, we can also call it covering. And anterior to the tegmentum, this area, we call this appended structures, this large part, which include the basal ganglion and uh, also the superior and inferior part, the anterior part of the uh, brainstem. The last slide shows you the mid, mid sagittal plane. And uh, this picture slide shows you the cross section of um, the brainstem. And you can see that this cross section are the, uh, from the three level. The left one is the medulla. The middle one is the pons. The right one is the midbrain. And you can see the three uh, brainstem subdivision uh, was labeled with a different color. So the blue color labeled is the tectum. So the tectum are only found, find, uh, found in the midbrain because it's comprised by the superior and inferior colliculi. And uh, the tegmentum is uh, the central core of the brainstem. So it can find in the whole uh, three levels. And it consists by the reticular formation, the, uh, the cranial nerve nucleus and tracts, and uh, ascending pathways from spinal cord and uh, some of these uh, descending pathways. And uh, the red color was lab labeled these uh, appended structures. So from the mid-brain cross-section, and you can see that is the cerebral peduncle. And uh, um, from the pons, you can see that composed the basal pons. And uh, from the medulla, that part is a, uh, you can contain the pyramid. And also it contains this, um, this part contains the descending tracts. 
from the cortex to the spinal cord. And also you have, you can find a lot of these dark dots. That is a cranial nerve nucleus. And uh, you have this pontine nucleus inside this um, uh, pons.